This is a 2009 Mercedes-Benz SL65 AMG Black Series, and it is the ultimate Mercedes SL. In fact, it's one of the craziest sports cars Mercedes ever made. Up here is a twin turbocharged V12 with 661 horsepower and 738 pound-feet of torque. This thing has more power than a Ferrari Enzo. Back when this car was new in 09, the base sticker price was $300,000. Mercedes-Benz made only 350 of these for the entire world. This is one of the 350, and today I'm going to take you on a tour of it. Now, I've borrowed this SL65 Black Series from a viewer here in the Dallas-Fort Worth, Texas area. As soon as he emailed me and offered me the chance to come and review this car, I knew I had to come to Texas to check it out. That's partially because I knew I probably wouldn't find another one. Like I said, Mercedes only made 350 of these for the entire planet, and of those, only 175 came to the United States. And this is one of the 175. So what makes this car so special? Well, it was created at a time when Mercedes-Benz was making Black Series high-performance versions of their already high-performance AMG cars. There was the SLK55 AMG Black Series, and there was the CLK63 Black Series, and the C63 Black Series. Now, the SLS Black Series supercar was supposedly the pinnacle of the Black Series lineup, but it's worth noting that this car had more power and more torque than the SLS Black Series. So today, I'm going to take you on a tour of the SL65 Black Series, and I'm going to show you all the interesting quirks and cool features of the Ultimate Mercedes SL, which, yes, had a starting sticker price of around $300,000 back when it was new. Then I'm going to get behind the wheel and drive it, which I've always wanted to do, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the Mercedes SL65 Black Series, click the link below to visit autotrader.com slash oversteer, where I've also compiled a list of the different generations of Mercedes-Benz SL, ranked from best to worst, in my opinion. Now, I'm going to start up front with the engine. Specifically, take a look at this thing. It is just freaking massive. It is absolutely huge and bulging and just ridiculously gigantic. It is so big, in fact, take a look at the top of the plastic engine cover. It doesn't even contain the whole engine. Mercedes-Benz fitted this plastic cover, and even their own plastic cover can't contain their giant Black Series engine. Next up, we must cover maybe the SL65 Black Series' most defining characteristic, and that would be the fender flares. Now, in order to achieve the kind of handling and high-speed stability Mercedes-Benz wanted, they had to fit extra wide tires in this car, front and back, and that meant they had to flare out the fenders in order to fit the tires under the bodywork, and they're insane. If you take a look at the brake lights, you can see basically how wide the regular SL was, since this car shares the brake lights with the SL. Everything beyond that is basically Black Series flared fenders. They are absolutely massive in order to take on these huge wheels. They flare out like six inches, they give this car a distinctive look that goes well beyond any other SL class. Now, possibly this car's most distinctive appearance feature is up front. That would be the little grill behind the front wheels that allows for some additional cooling. Needless to say, your standard SL500 doesn't have that. Now, not a lot of people know the Black Series, but if you know this car and you see these fenders, then you know what you're looking at, and then you flip out. But while car enthusiasts appreciate those fender flares, they are not my favorite exterior design detail on this car. That honor goes to the roof. Check this out. Every other Mercedes SL from this generation was a convertible. The SL65 Black Series had a fixed roof. It was a coupe. In other words, Mercedes-Benz created an entirely new body style just for this car, even though they were only making 350 units. That is a truly insane investment. Now, the interesting thing is Mercedes-Benz did this for a purpose. Obviously, adding a roof adds structural rigidity, which helps on the racetrack, but it also saved weight. By removing the power top and all the mechanisms and levers and motors in there, Mercedes-Benz claims they shaved 500 pounds off the weight of the original SL class to make the Black Series car. Of course, there were a few other items that also helped, like adding carbon fiber front fenders, and check out the bottom of the hood. You can see the carbon fiber 
fiber weave down there. Needless to say, you don't see that in your regular old SL550 cruising around the retirement village. Now, speaking of carbon fiber stuff, I mentioned the front fenders were carbon fiber. The rear fenders are also carbon fiber to save weight. And one way you can tell that is if you open up the fuel door, you can see the carbon fiber weave next to the fuel filler on the fender, which is really cool. Now, if you look at the fuel door itself, you can also see that too is carbon fiber, which seems like a little bit of overkill. I don't know how many ounces that could have possibly shaved off, but they did it. Now, another interesting thing on that fuel door, if you look closely, you'll notice it has a QR code on it, which is a little weird for a fuel door. So naturally, I was curious and I scanned the QR code and it takes you to this Mercedes-Benz website that basically shows you the location of your batteries, your airbags, your fuel tank, and that's it. I'm not sure why they thought that would be helpful, but well, it's there. Next up, another interesting exterior item. Obviously, Mercedes-Benz added the fixed roof to save weight over the convertible and to add structural rigidity, but there was another reason. If this car had been a convertible with all the top mechanisms and stuff under here, Mercedes never would have been able to add a giant adjustable wing on the back. So making it a coupe meant they could also put on this huge wing, which is another characteristic Black Series design detail. No regular SL550 has a wing like this. Something I didn't notice about this wing is that it is in fact adjustable. You push a little button inside the cabin and then the wing goes up and down to your liking so you can place it exactly where you want for optimal downforce or appearance, let's be honest. Now, speaking of the wing, another interesting difference between this car and the standard SL comes on the trunk lid. You can see that they had to include basically this giant lip in order to allow the wing to come all the way down. That means in addition to using a different top and different fenders and a different hood than the standard SL, Mercedes also had to make a different trunk lid specifically for this ultra limited production model. But anyway, back to the spoiler. Now the result of that adjustable spoiler is that the trunk is absolutely ridiculous. You see these little plastic things on the inside on the roof of the trunk lid? Well, they contain the little pillars of the spoiler when the spoiler is going down or up depending on where it is adjusted. That may seem sort of innocuous, but when you shut the trunk, those little plastic things cut into whatever you've placed inside the trunk itself. So if you have golf clubs back here, for example, and you slam the trunk shut, those little plastic things, they go basically all the way in and they're going to bend your golf clubs. It's hilarious. So you have a trunk in this car, but because of that rear wing, it's a slightly less practical trunk than the one you would have in a regular SL. Now, since I'm in the trunk, one other interesting item in here. Now, all cars in the United States are mandated by the federal government to have a little release inside the trunk. So in case you get locked in a trunk, you can usually pull a little lever, the trunk opens, and you can climb out. Interestingly, in this car, they decided not to go with a lever. Instead, it's this little green button that just pulses, lighting itself up every couple of seconds so that you know exactly where you can press in order to get let out of the trunk in case someone ever kidnaps you in an SL65 AMG Black Series. Next up around back, another interesting item is the rear diffuser. It is absolutely massive, like most rear diffusers on high-performance sports cars but the interesting thing about this one is the middle part is very shiny. In fact, it's almost reflective, so it gives you an opportunity to see what the ground looks like. And our final exterior quirk on this car, that would be the wheels. I always loved the wheels on the SL65 Black Series. They're very distinctive. They were only placed on this car. In fact, this design wasn't even really used in any other vehicle, let alone these specific wheels. And they made it very clear that if you were looking at this car and you saw these wheels, you weren't looking at a regular SL550. Now, next up, I'm going to move on to the interior of the Black Series, where there are quite a few interesting quirks, but I'm going to start with the one that's the most exciting, and that would be simply turning it on. First off, the engine start-stop button has sort of an odd placement. It's on this weird triangular silver piece in the center console, and it's actually facing sort of toward the windshield and not towards the driver. But once you get past that weirdness and you press the button, well, it's glorious. Take a listen. <laughs> It 
was just the startup noise. I'm going to ref it for you in a minute, but first we must cover the interior quirks. I'm going to start with the door panel, and specifically the door panel storage compartment. You press this little silver thing, and not only does the lid lift up on the door panel storage compartment, but the entire side of the storage compartment sort of moves forward to allow you to stick in something a little bit larger than you could get in if only the lid lifted up. When you want to close the door panel storage, you just push the lid and then both items meet together in the middle in door panel storage harmony. Also another interesting item in the door panel area is the door sills. You can see there's a nice AMG logo in the door sill. The weird thing about the sill though is it's like a three-step door sill. There's one door sill and then there's another with the AMG logo and then there's another one on top of that. It's an odd thing. I've never really seen it before. If you were a Chihuahua trying to climb into an SL65 Black Series, you could use those as stairs. Next up, two kind of unusual status lights in this car. One is the light that comes on when you turn on the headlights. Now, in basically every other car, you turn on the headlights and a little light appears in the gauge cluster letting you know the headlights are on. For some reason, they decided not to do that in this car. Instead, a tiny little green light appears next to the headlight switch where you would never be able to see it to let you know that your headlights are on. It is a very strange placement for that. Also, just as strange is the trunk opener placement. In a lot of cars, you open the trunk and a little warning label comes on in the gauge cluster to let you know your trunk is open so you don't drive away. In this car, the only way that you would know your trunk is open is a tiny little red light that comes on on the door panel next to the trunk latch button. It's a very strange placement for that since most people don't look at their door panel when they're driving along down the street. Next up, moving on to the gauge cluster. Something I find cool in this car, the gauge cluster is unique to the Black Series. The tachometer is especially cool. It says V12 bi-turbo and it's, it's all white instead of black like normal Mercedes SL gauges. That way you know you're in something kind of special. It's, it's obviously only a tiny little detail, but of course those are the ones I like the most. Another interesting item inside the gauge cluster is that the gauge cluster is so small there's no room for a screen for like a driver information display to let you know like what gear you're in or what your range is or whatever. So instead they fitted two tiny little screens, one inside the speedometer and one inside the tachometer. And the result is there's some weird things. Specifically, take a look at range. The screen on the left says the word range, and then the screen on the right displays what your actual range is that you have left. Boy, am I glad that we've moved on to full color screens in the gauge clusters of most new cars, because these old black and white screens with the little pixel displays, yeah, they're starting to look outdated really fast. Next up, another interesting item inside the gauge cluster. If you scroll through the various menus, you will eventually come to the trip information. Now, the owner of this car drives it a lot, and it doesn't look like he has reset the trip information a long time, over 6,000 miles, and you can see his average fuel economy over that time, which actually isn't really all that bad when you consider this car has a giant V12, and he's probably flooring it all the time just to see what it can do. It's actually kind of impressive. Next up, moving on to the middle of the interior. Even though this is a tiny little tight sports car interior, it does include cup holders. Two of them, in fact, and their operation is a little bit unusual. They're located below the infotainment screen. Now, the passenger side one, you push out, and then it sort of turns and opens up so you can place your drink there. The driver's side one can't do the same thing, because if it did that, it would sort of block your knee while you're trying to work the pedals and drive the car. So instead, it just sort of sits there. Now, personally, I find this to be unusual cup holder placement, because as the drinks start to evaporate, isn't the drink going to go all over the infotainment system that they're sort of angled towards? And if not that, won't it go all over the climate control system that's right below them? Next up, another interesting item. Below the transmission lever in this car, you will see a bank of switches. And if you look closely, you'll notice that most of them are blank. In fact, there are five switches there, and four of them are blank, reminding you that even though you spent $300,000 on an SL65 Black Series, there are some features you don't have. Although in Mercedes-Benz defense, I think in the regular SL, some of those switches are used to control the power convertible top to put it down and up, which obviously this car doesn't have. Still, Mercedes-Benz went to the trouble of creating a roof for this car and fenders and a hood and a trunk lid. You think they could have created an interior panel without any blank switches on it. Anyway, speaking of switches, if you look to the right of the transmission lever, you'll see a little switch marked M1 slash M2. This is for manual mode. And according to Mercedes-Benz, if you put it in 
M1, it tightens up the shifts when you shift. If you put it in M2, it tightens them up even more. This car doesn't have a traditional dual clutch like modern supercars, but M2 was supposed to sort of be as close as they could come in 2009. Oh, and speaking of the gear lever, one interesting item with the gear lever, take a look at the top of the gear lever and you can see that it says on it, USA 1 of 175, just to drive home the point you're in something rare in case you've forgotten. Or maybe it's so that you can kind of brag to your passenger. You see? You see? One of only 175. I told you. It says it right here on the gear lever. You see? <laughs> Next up, moving on to the infotainment system. Now, in modern cars, I find a lot of interesting quirks and features in the infotainment system, but in the older cars, these systems were so simple, there's just not all that much there. Still, here's one quirk. If you go to pair your phone, it says, ready for Bluetooth telephony, rather than telephone, using a word no one would ever use. Next up, moving below the infotainment screen and onto the climate controls. They're not all that unusual on their face. The little silver wheels adjust the temperature. The little black dial in the middle changes how much air is coming out. It's pretty simple, except there's one button below that black dial marked off. And the thing I've learned is when you press off, it's off and you can't get it back on. In fact, turn the little dial to increase the amount of air and nothing happens because you turned it off. Now, if you want the climate control to come back on again, you press off again and then that turns it back on and then you can adjust it. So if you have it off, you can't do anything until you turn it on by pressing off. Only the Germans would create a system that works in this way. Next up, we must discuss the seats, which have a couple of interesting characteristics, one of which is the fact that there are these little white rectangles stitched on to the seats, 10 on each seat. And I've been in a lot of AMG cars, CLK Black Series, CLK DTM. I've driven just about all of them, and none of them had these seats. And I wonder, why did they possibly put these little rectangles on there? I'll probably never answer that question, but they did. Now, one interesting item with these seats, this is a $300,000, 660-horsepower supercar and it has massaging seats. There's a little pulse button right in front of the seats. You push it, and then the massage function starts to come on. And that's a very nice feeling when you're driving down the road, except this car doesn't have heated seats. It has massaging seats, it has power seats, but not heated seats. You'd expect that in a $300,000 car, but if you were expecting it, well, you'll be disappointed because you ain't getting it. This is a two-seat car, like all SLs, except for the SLC Coupe in the 70s, which I don't consider a real SL because it was tremendously ugly. But anyway, behind the seats, there is storage compartments back there, and they open up, and you can put, you know, some stuff in there, I guess, if, if you want to get it out of plain sight so no one breaks into your SL65 Black Series. In addition to those storage compartments, there is also a glove box. You pop it open, and, well, it's just like a normal glove box, and it contains the owner's manual. Now, the owner's manual this thing is pretty cool. You got to admit, it doesn't just say 2009 SL class. It's tailor-made for this car, SL65 AMG Black Series. And this is a rare piece. There's only 350 of these cars. The manuals are different based on the country you're in. So this thing could pull big money on eBay, I bet. Now, of course, the manual has a couple of unusual items in it. For example, I take you to page 199 under a section called Vehicle Care for the chrome-plated exhaust tip. It says, regular cleaning and care of the chrome-plated exhaust tips will help maintain their shine and classy appearance. Ah, if you want to maintain your classy appearance, just consult your SL65 Black Series owner's manual, and it'll let you know what to do. Another interesting item can be found on page 202. Two, under practical hints, where will I find the first aid kit? Before it tells you where to find the first aid kit, it says, check expiration dates and contents for completeness at least once a year and replace missing and expired items. They want you to check your first aid kit annually and then, you know, replace stuff if it's expired. <laughs> that is the most German thing I've ever seen in an owner's manual. I can promise you not one single person who has this car has checked their first aid kit since 2009. Anyway, all the weird quirks aside, I must now drive this car, but before I do that, one little item I think you're going to want to hear, and that would be a rev of this engine. Take a listen. Okay, so those are all the quirks and features of the SL65 Black Series, which is quirkier than most Mercedes-Benz models. Now it's time to get behind the wheel and get out on the road in the ultimate Mercedes SL. Your first impression, it's impossible for the first impression not to be that the ride is really, really rough. <laughs> you go over little bumps and man, 
and you can just feel everything. You can even feel the little tiny lines in the pavement and everything just so rough. Your second impression <laughs> is just how much power you have. Just tapping the throttle, you can already start to feel it. It lurches forward. Here's a little straightaway. Roll into it. Whoa. <laughs> okay. That was me kind of like rolling into on the throttle, just sort of a little bit and a little more. I think I tapped the floor for like a quarter of a second. That was intense. The owner of this car told me it gets gross. So the owner of this car also has a CLK 63 Black Series and he watched my video with that and he said, that thing does get a little squirrely and this is like that on a higher level. So that kind of scared me. I'm on a road now that the, the pavement quality isn't good. I mean, it's, it's relatively well paved, but the, the surface they've used is, is loud and you can just hear everything. It's crazy how loud it is inside this car. And I can feel it all through the steering wheel too. The car feels very stable and very composed, uh, but it isn't a luxury car. It isn't quiet. This isn't like the regular SL. All right, I'm gonna roll on the throttle again. I just have to experience that again. like I got kicked from behind. Oh, that's fast. That feels really fast. Wow. Absolutely zero body roll, surprisingly precise pre steering considering I'm in an SL. Granted, this is the SL, but it stays very flat, very stable. You can hear all this stuff kind of creaking in, in the back. It's all the top stuff, I think. This car didn't go through the same noise vibration testing that the regular SL did. It's just really fast. Zero to 60 is the same as the regular SL65, despite the 50, 60 extra horsepower. But where you really feel how fast this car is, is not zero to 60. It's, uh, it's when you floored at 60. And you're just going along like normal on the highway, and then <gasps> it broke loose. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I was, that was literally going 60. The back, the back started, the, the owner of this car was like, yeah, I just take the traction control off. I'm like, what, what are you talking about? I have to admit, I showed you before the, uh, the cold start and the exhaust note, and they sounded really good. Inside the car, it actually doesn't quite sound like, you know, the crazy kind of high performance car that I was expecting it to. It has more of a muffled sound to it, almost more like a jet or something like that. Uh, just sort of building power rather than some car kind of letting you know, you know, that it's building power. It doesn't really do that. All right, now only because there's no one around, the owner said to it's raining a little bit. I'm going to turn the traction control all the way off and do a little start. <laughs> the owner told me he's got new wheels and tires coming. He said, go roast the tires. So I'm not going to roast the tires. He said, no, do it, do it. So let's try that again. There's no one around. I'm going to floor it here from a stop. doesn't go anywhere. So lesson, don't turn off the traction control unless you just, unless you have new tires on order and you don't care. No denying, this is a very impressive car. Very insane and ridiculous and crazy. Better around corners than I expected, better composed than I expected, horrible ride quality, terrible tire noise, incredible power. Zero to 60, good. 60 to 100, great. This really is a supercar, but sort of in a different definition of supercar. It's, it's frankly the successor to the SLR. That's what this feels like. And honestly, it feels faster than the SLR. This is a monster, monster vehicle. And I'm really lucky that I had the opportunity to drive it because there aren't many of these. And so that's the Mercedes SL65 Black Series. This thing is a menace. It is massively powerful. And in fact, a decade after this car came out, it is still the most powerful Mercedes-Benz road-going production car in the brand's entire history. Unless you count that weird ultra-limited production CLK GTR road race car thing. This car is also insane cool, transforming the SL class from an old man's luxury cruiser in Palm Beach to a true supercar. And now it's time to give it a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the SL65 Black Series isn't the most beautiful car, but I've always loved just how intimidating and how special it looks, and it gets an 8 out of 10. Acceleration, it does 0 to 60 in 3.6 seconds, and it gets an 8 out of 10. Handling, it's good, but it's not ultra precise like modern supercars, and it gets a 7 out of 10. 
Cool factor is high. This car is still discussed as one of the coolest supercars from this era, and it gets a 9 out of 10. But importance isn't quite as high. It may be an expensive, limited production supercar, but it's based on the regular old Mercedes SL, and it gets a 7 out of 10, bringing the total weekend score to 39 out of 50. As for the daily categories, starting with features, the Black Series is obviously pretty far behind modern times, and it gets a 4 out of 10. Comfort, the ride is rough and there's a lot of interior noise, but the seats are nice and comfy and they massage. It gets a 4 out of 10. Quality is fine, the interior is nice, but I'd worry about reliability, and I'm only giving it a 6 out of 10. Practicality is low, of course. It has 7.1 cubic feet of cargo space, and it gets a 3 out of 10. Finally, value. These still bring big money, but it's hard to know if it's worth it. The SL65 Black Series is rare, sure, but it's hard to know if values will shoot up or continue slowly trickling down. I'm giving it a 6 out of 10 for a total daily score of 23 out of 50. Add it up, and the Doug score is 62 out of 100. And here's the SL65 Black Series next to some other 2000s supercars I've reviewed. On the weekend categories, it beats out everything but the Mercedes SLR and the Lexus LFA, but on the daily categories it loses to everything but the Lamborghini Diablo 6.0 and the Mercedes CLK DTM. The SL65 Black Series isn't a car you want to drive every day, but it's damn cool when you do drive it. And it brag to your passenger. You see? You see? One of only 175. I told you. It says it right here on the gear lever. You see? <laughs> I don't even know what that was.